Come join us and have your say. Let's talk about our way. Remember you are not alone. Buddha is the light in your home. We'll talk about Buddha. We'll talk about our way. Come join us and have your say. Let's talk about our way. Remember you are not alone. Buddha is the light in your home. It's 8.30 in Nigeria, 9.30 in Cairo, and 11.30 in the Gulf. But you guys know what time it is. It's time for Viewers Pulse. Alhamdulillah, thank you guys for tuning in to the Pulse. And thank you, as always, for supporting Huda TV. I certainly hope you caught that last episode of Ask Huda just half an hour ago. I got the pending questions right here, which I will forward to the Sheikh. So if he didn't ask your questions on this episode, he will next time, inshallah. Having said that, you guys know our phone uh, numbers. It's on the screen there, 0020238. Triple five two four eight or nine, you guys, give us a call, and uh, I will be more than pleased uh, to speak with you, inshallah. Don't forget the other information. You guys know it, like the Facebook or the email, rather, pulse at huda.tv, which should also appear on your screen shortly, pulse at huda.tv. I answered like 20 emails today. Please just send it one time. It'll be, guys, you guys, I get the same email three, four times. Uh, so please, please, inshallah, just send it one time, inshallah, and give me a couple, a week or so to get back to you. Uh, having said that, Facebook, support us on Facebook. Uh, dot com slash huda dot tv as well as the individual pages uh, and I'm rushing through this because we have a special guest okay uh, also Skype un huda underscore tv and we do have a new YouTube channel you guys huda satellite tv please support it subscribe to it watch the videos huda satellite tv we will upload everything inshallah to our new official YouTube channel huda satellite tv having said that let's get into the episode we have a very very special guest he is the director of uh, Australia uh, Center for Islamic Finance, as well as a lecturer at La Trobe University. He is a new face to her TV, and he's in the process of filming an all-new program talking about Islamic finance. You saw on Uma tonight. Of course, I'm talking to my brother, Almer Kolan. Assalamu alaikum, brother Almer. How are you? Alaikum assalam. Alhamdulillah. Very well. Hey, I'm very happy to have you on this program. And like I said, on this program, like I spoke with you before the episode, uh, we're just giving people insight into the programs that are up and coming and new on Huda TV. And before we do that, we want to give them a little in insight about the person presenting the show so they can kind of get a background and a feel for the program. So perhaps you can start by telling us a little bit about yourself, how you got into uh, and how you got interested in Islamic finance, uh, where you got your education. And tell us a little bit about yourself, the viewers that is. Originally, I was never interested in finance of any kind. I mean, that was the last thing in my mind, finance. Oh, my God, <laughs> such a boy. Why would anyone want to know about finance? It was such a dry topic. Yeah, right. uh, originally, I was interested in every other subject. Uh, by nature, I think I'm an uh, activist. So I, I, I got early in 90s involved in Dawa. We started organizations. And, and this was a time of when Dawa was really at its peak. And, and, and we, we, we were like on the wings. We so wanted to learn everything. We were with Sheikh sitting uh, full time for yeah, 10, 15 years. Actually, for uh, more than 10 years, I, I was uh, learning classical uh, sciences. You know, right. we would sit with the Sheikh, read a book, go uh, words by words, see this, all of these normal things. You know, and I noticed whenever we would go on the Kitab of Buyu or something, the number would kind of decrease. Right. But I, I got a desire, like, let me actually get this is very logical right uh, science and it, it fits in the whole scheme of things the finance finance right. uh, so beside being activist I, I i also loved psychology right psychology and uh, in, in 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 my training at university i started engineering right because i love to f figure out how things work yeah so when i combine this activism Right. Finance. I also love the sulfic, like my Sheikh Ibrahim says, this is like a management of your thoughts yeah, you know, when you go through that. And I love that description. So this all sciences somehow came together into the finance. Yeah, my Very father. unusual. So this is how I end up learning more. And I say, Alhamdulillah, that I learned Islam before I started learning Islam and finance. Yes, my and this is, I think, uh, <laughs> when we then, uh, I did the master in the f first uh, in the management and the business, then in finance, and then in Islamic banking and finance, another master. So, so I kind of completed right. uh, both sides, so understanding what is Islamic finance. Of course, from classical, even until today, I go to, whether it's Islamic countries like Qatar, for example, to take a course here and there in some specialized area. Online, I take, again, 
I, I consider myself a, as a student, although I teach at university. Right. But even now, for example, I take online class from Sheikh Zarabozo. You know, he's doing now like six, seven semesters just on Fiqh Finance. Mashallah. And I benefit hugely yeah. from, from, from these authorities and this intelligence yes, uh, that is out there. So really, I consider myself as a, somebody who is very eager to learn right, okay. these things. So this is how I end up, and, and, and I hope that... I understand a uh, little bit how it works. Yes, so. But the, the way you describe Islamic finance to me, it's actually fascinating and amazing, really. Uh, so perhaps let's talk about your program now. I believe you tentatively title it Islamic finance, but I'm not sure if you settle on that. Uh, tell us, first of all, who is the target audience for this program and why? Target audience, in reality, are, in my mind, youth who are between 15 and 30. Okay. That's a number one. And also those who are professionals who work uh, as, as a, uh, you know, accountants, uh, financial planners, bankers, and, 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 and policy makers and so on. So there are two sides of these things. Okay. On one side, we encourage entrepreneurship, opening your mindset that you want to be upper hand, work, right. get busy, right. add value. You know, so we encourage these sorts of uh, attitudes towards money and the finance okay. to have aspiration what you want to do and also we teach technical what is allowed what is not allowed but this is secondary in my mind right. the first is that entrepreneurship right. spirit that we want to youth understand. to actually start doing being constructive you know right yeah so that we can build uh, the capacity for them to change around themselves situation and right. what is going on so we although you will be explaining what is permissible and impermissible for individual people but the main purpose we can say is to instill that spirit of entrepreneurship in a halal way so i think that is uh, 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 amazing having said that you know so much about islamic finance from what i've heard from you speak and you really make it interesting and you know i've heard other people speak about it and it sounds a bit dry like you said but you make it come to life having said that uh, did you study conventional finance how in order to compare and contrast it with islamic finance mm -hmm. while i was uh, getting education, obviously, in other sci Islamic scientists, I s purposely studied uh, conventional with Islamic. Okay. Uh, reason is that sometimes you need to know the tricks in conventional. What are the dangers? What are the problems? Right. Because this tend to be replicated in Islamic finance. Okay, okay. So, in order to know, because sometimes we, uh, perhaps a, a, a scholar has learned something theoretically, but then when he gets on the ground, he can't apply that learning to the modern world. Is that, do you agree with that? Exactly. I mean, I was in the bank recently, Islamic financial institution, just recently, and we, I was reviewing some, like a contract uh, arrangement. Okay. And I realized something is not right. You see, most of the people, they're around me, they've been doing Islamic finance and classically understand this, but I felt that something is wrong. Until I started drilling and this conventional understanding was clear to me that this is not Sharia compliant arrangement, whether it's how it was calculated, right. how it was structured. And I think you cannot really understand and appreciate Islamic finance until you see a reality of what is the conventional finance as well. Yeah. So you have to know both. Yeah, Ignorance course. will not help you. Yeah. In fact, if you don't know Jahiliya and, and uh, things like that, you will fall into it. Of course, so you said in order to stay away from being naive and for appreciation of Islamic finance, I believe that's an uh, excellent uh, point. We do have a short clip, but then I want to, when we get back to this clip, I would like you to explain it. Then I want to talk to you about honest mistakes, perhaps in the Islamic finance field, and how we should blame, uh, you know, individuals who make mistakes, but Islamic finance is something that's coming from the Quran and the Sunnah, so it's uh, perfect. So I want to talk about that. But uh, let's check out this clip, you guys at home, and we're going to have Brother Amir Kolen talk about it uh, on his all-new program about Islamic finance. So check it out. There is no one in Islam or anywhere else who blames the prophet or who want, don't want to, to see that prophet. So, so we are all, we want that that's fine, that, you know, we are, we are not against the prophet. Yes. What we are against is how do you make that prophet? What sort of steps you do and how do you use money in that situation? Because we don't want money to be used in a way that go against the nature of money as a medium of exchange, something you buy and sell with, fulfills this function. In fact, in Islam, for money to be useful, we have to convert it, as you will see in this, in, in this uh, program, we will discuss this in detail, money must be converted to something that is useful in itself. And then, 
that's something which we let's say call asset. That asset then can be sold or leased or you can make use of it. To make what? To make a tea, to make a profit. Okay. And this is where you will find fundamental difference between Islamic finance and any other kind of finance. It comes fundamentally on the way you use money. <laughs> So before we talk about the, the content, um, the format of the show, you're standing up and, and, and you have students there. Can you explain the, the format of the show itself a little bit, the structure? Well, I find it, it is maybe more interesting if we have a students and then we can interact, they can ask questions. Yeah. Uh, maybe I miss something or something needs more explanation. I, right. I, I love that. I need that feedback. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't want that studio where there is no yeah. one I'm talking to the camera. It doesn't and work with me. It doesn't work for all of us because you don't know how I, I agree with you. Yeah. You need that interaction. Now, well put. So you're talking about profit. You said we l everybody wants to make a profit, but we want to know how do we make the profit. So yeah. that's a, what do you mean by that? Uh, well, fundamentally, what we mean by that is that uh, there is nothing wrong with making profit. That's the purpose of business. If you want to be upper hand, like Professor Salam said, that Absolutely. this is the better. And if you want to sustain yourself, as Fukaha of Ahlul Sunnah Wal Jamaa said, that uh, 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 earning and working up to the level where you can support yourself is something that is a must, specifically for the men. And not just earning to support yourself, but those you are legally responsible. Now, if, if you want to discharge this obligation, we have to go business. We right. have to make money. Right. And right. this is, like Quran tells us, if you spend from the good things you earn, right. how do you spend if you don't earn? So this gives us that we must earn. Right. And how we do that? Through a legitimate way. Right. Not by pushing the money like in conventional banking, where money is treated as a commodity, which is bought and sold, but rather in a way that makes money work. There's some risk, reward, assets, real things but involved. That, that's why you said money in itself isn't useful. That's right. Money in itself does not have what we say utility. So uh -huh. to make use of money, must we must buy something else, convert it into something that is useful, and then this asset is bought and sold, and we make profit from that. Because now we say this, say this American dollar mm -hmm. is a piece of paper with a promise of a certain value, but in itself it has no utility. So yeah. we want to transfer it to a tangible. Even if it was back to gold. Right. As a medium of exchange, as a money, not as a gold, as a commodity, as a money medium of exchange, right. it has to be converted into something. You can't build a house with it. You have right. to buy material. Yeah, you can't yeah, eat. I you have to, be, like yeah. Imam, uh, uh, like Hassan al-Basri said, money is such a friend that only benefits you when it leaves you. <laughs> when <laughs> right. it's converted to something right. else. Right, useful. Masala. We have to take a short break. You guys stay with us. So we have a, a wonderful conversation about Islamic banking and finance. So stay tuned. <laughs> Medina, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and his companions faced lots of troubles and difficulties and enmities and obstacles in the way to Medina before the Hijrah to Medina from Mecca. Uh, also Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has assisted his beloved Prophet and supported him in order to complete his mission and to, uh, uh, to immigrate to Medina. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, has granted us this great Prophet and his companions. Now the question why the immigration to Medina, the Hijrah of Rasulullah and his companions, was a turning point in the history of uh, Hijrah and the history of Islam. My dear brothers and sisters, what are the sacrifices that the Prophet Muhammad has faced with his companions? Some of these difficulties, inshallah, we will learn together and we will focus on some lessons. What are the lessons that we take from these incidents, inshallah, in our program, uh, Road to Medina? My dear brothers, stay tuned with us, inshallah, in this great uh, uh, event of Hijrah. We will, inshallah, focus on some of the lessons uh, of in this program, Road to Medina. May Allah make it easy for us and accept our good deeds and gather us with our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in Jannah. Amen. You guys, welcome back to the Pulse. We're still here with Brother Amir Kolan. Brother, thank you so much for your time. 
uh, this is a, uh, I'm having an interesting conversation with you, learning more about Islamic economics. Uh, what about some specific topics on your new program, which you're recording now, next to the studio, actually right here in the same studio, right behind the camera, is the decor there. Um, what are some specific topics that you've already addressed in the first five or six episodes that you filmed, and what are some topics that you'll get into, inshallah? Uh, number one, we start with the basic Islamic uh, uh, law of contracts because we say that uh, riba and trades fundamentally two different things. Okay. Therefore, you need to understand certain issues when it comes to contract. What you can buy, how you buy, how you do things. Then, uh, who are the parties in the contract? What are their rights, responsibility? How is this executed? What is the end result of executing contract in a specific way? Okay. After we look at these things, we look at the specific prohibition in Muamalat which are our business dealings, mutual dealings. Okay. We look at the pro prohibitions, such as, for example, zarar, uncertainty, riba, uh, uh, two-in-one contracts, all of these things, okay. buying and selling what you don't have. Then we go into specific modes of financing, okay. murabaha, musharaka, uh, salam, istisna, how these all things work. Then we connect these in the bank. How does it work in a bank? Okay, okay. Can I buy the shares? Can I invest in gold? Can I do this? Can I buy this, that on credit, on right. spot, and so on? So, right. so there's lots of topics, lots of different things that, you know, if you are any small business, want to do something, uh, ex doing certain transactions, as most of the scholars say, up to the level where you are involved in these business transactions, it become a must to know yeah. rulings on these matters. Yes. Is at least up to the level that you're involved. Involved, that's yeah. right. That's so a minimum. So this program will benefit, you don't have to be a, a scholar looking to learn about, this benefits you as an individual, individual Muslim who would like to make sure and yeah. verify his transactions are permissible. That, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And, and for learning in general. You know, you, you go buy, buy something on eBay, you know, can I buy jewelry on eBay? Right. You know, there is, you know, so, so is this permissible? Right. Uh, I, I, I do simple things, you know, in, in everyday life I need to know. Right, of course. Is this something that is okay or not? And I'd venture to say probably 25% of the questions on Ask Huda uh, we receive from our viewers from all around the world are regarding uh, bank uh, contracts from his mm -hmm. bank loans uh, for from Islamic banks and this is so perhaps this will clarify for the viewers the first episodes about the contract how that exactly works uh, what about let's look at some Islamic institutions now we see Islamic banks mashallah popping up uh, around the world uh, we should always remind our viewers Islamic finance is perfect and there's no mistake in that because it's mm -hmm. divine revelation although sometimes people make mistakes a sheikh may, may make a mistake perhaps uh, this was written wrong or this was but this is not a point against Islamic finance rather this is a point against us because we're still preparing ourselves really to show Islamic finance to the world that's right uh, you see that there is principles of Islamic banking and finance and how you apply these principles and sometimes what we are looking, spe especially when I consult with some of these businesses, is, is there real trade taking place? Is this just synthetic arrangement right. in the contracts? Or is there something real happening, ah, you know? Right. This because we, we know that there is difference between trade and riba. However, what is real trade? How it is taking place? And what we want from the bank is to have skin in the game. What do you mean by that? I mean bank must have some risk to get the return. Yes. You can't be divorced from risk. That's what we see in global financial crisis. People were structuring yes. things, no risk, and they destabilize the entire system. Okay, excellent point. I like what you said, skin in the game, meaning there has to be a risk, and we have to take care about synthetic movements. I That's mean, right. you have to have real action. That's right. Yeah, excellent point. Um, we have another clip from your program. You guys, let's check it out, and we'll get the other brother, Am Amir Kolanz, the director of the Australian uh, Center for Islamic Finance. We'll get his thoughts on that, so stay tuned. You will realize that there are two extremes whenever somebody talks about money. One is that all negative characteristics, and another one is all positive and the best. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and, and in Islam, in fact, when you think about money, that's why we call wealth fitna, mm -hmm. which means like a trial. Yes. It takes you left or right, mm -hmm. depends. What, what's inside of you? Explain that clip a little bit, brother. What do you mean by, what, what, by that, what you said there? So money by itself is just like a tool. Now, the way you use tool, as uh, Sheikh Muhammad Sharif once said in his lecture, it's something, money is something that magnifies what's in your heart. So right. whatever is in your heart, it will be amplified by the yeah. way you use money. <laughs> yeah, that's so right. that's why it's a called fitna. Uh, wealth is fitna. Yeah, because it's a test. It's a test. It's a trial. Take yeah. you left or right. Yeah, I like it. That's a wonderful uh, 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 point. You know, I, I hear people um, say 
In Islamic finance, you can't simply sell a product that you don't own. Mm -hmm. um, so what about stocks and bonds and this sort of thing? And Wall Street, aren't we playing with numbers and figures? We don't own that, right? Mm. Uh, well, this is a tough one, tough one. Uh, let's forget a little bit to Wall Street for a second. In general, idea of a stock, of a share, is that this represents real ownership in the company, like what we have in Musharaka, for example. So this represents some real ownership. Now, to buy shares in a specific company, now we're not looking at any specific way. Uh, for instance, companies doing mining, we first look at what sort of business, core business they are in. Mining is something Sharia compliant. Okay. Now, once we clear that issue, we look at the financial ratios. And that is a scholar's device, certain rules, and this is a matter of ijtihad. Okay. But they are looking at, is there an interest attached to this as a profit? Because you see, for example, mining must be, uh, could be halal, right. but there is lots of cash sitting in the bank account. Number one problem is if it is not invested in the right way, it's an interest generating right, asset. Right, right. Also, if it is lots of cash, then when I buy and sell, if there is a lots of it, this becomes intangible asset. Meaning, if I'm negotiating the price of the shares that has lots of cash or receivables, okay. intangible assets, what I'm doing is I'm negotiating the, the price of the money. And right. this is what we see a ribal fadl. Meaning that you take a specific amount of money and you buy it with a different amount of money. Okay. So this could be a problem. So that's why we have screening where, where, where the scholars screen the shares before they are bought and sold. Yes, yeah, subhanAllah. Okay. But in reality, it, is, uh, it does represent ownership, although it's not clear-cut. Um, okay, so it's a case-by-case -case basis, we uh, can yes, say. Yes, you need to screen them, yes. Oh, okay. And what about, brother, uh, this issue of riba or, in or interest? It seems like it's become confused these days, and it's very difficult for the average person to understand it to the point where many people say, you know what, I don't want to hear about it anymore. I, I don't understand it. You know, people have given up even. I see this, unfortunately, in some Muslim countries. So uh, do you address this issue? Do you clearly define what, me what does riba mean in, in your program? Uh, a riba is a specific type of a contract where you have, for example, as Professor Sam said, when you exchange gold for gold, for example, which is like for like. Right. It must be equal to equal and must be hand to hand. But then why would you do that? Why would you exchange an equal e for equal amount? Right. Uh, whenever you exchange money, your purpose is to get you to the position where you want to trade after. Okay, so if I came to Egypt, I need to exchange uh, oh, right. Australian yeah, dollar for another currency yeah. or any way. Okay. We don't want that you make, this is facilitating yeah. type of transaction. We don't want to make profit from this. Where money gives birth to another money. Okay. Okay. This now, is wrong. That, that is completely wrong. Ah. However, what I want with this money in reality is to buy some property or the, uh, or the right. things that I need. Right. So Riba comes in this contract where the similar things are exchanged. And usually what you see is I will give you then some time in order for increase okay. later. Right. So this, this creates a certain anomaly. Right. Where, where you see the credit grows. That's why you have now derivatives and the products and interest is much, much more in economy than real money, real economy. It's 12 times more than uh, whole assets that we produce on the planet Earth. And this is where that distor distortion. Of course, historically, I mean, abusing people, taking their money, yeah. this can be all done in this. Uh, yeah, th th you know, even this has been apparent to, 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 to people all around the world. Uh, regardless of what religious background mm -hmm. they come from, they now see the evils uh, of Riba. Having said that, we only have a couple minutes left. Uh, give me some insight into where you, you're, where, where you reside in Australia. Do you see Islamic finance growing there, popular among non-Muslims? We see, I have, uh, I have, for example, now I'm, I'm doing the course online where uh, amongst 140 students, we have about 10 even non-Muslims. Great. So we see lots of uh, government is introducing new measures to address taxation. Uh, in order to facilitate for Islamic finance. Now, many, many people see uh, opportunities. This will benefit Muslims and other people. This is a different way of doing the finance. And of course, we don't underestimate that people want to uh, tap into this liquidity that exists in sure. the Middle East sure. due to the booming oil prices and so on. Of course. So people have different intentions. Government have different intentions. People have. But the idea is that, especially in Australia, where we are surrounded with hundreds of millions of Muslims, this is very interesting for the future of Australia. We are yes. have Malaysians, Indonesians, and by the time I fly to Cairo from Melbourne, I go over 900 million Muslims. Yeah, <laughs> so we're having the trade, business, other relationship, and this is becoming more and more prominent. Yeah, 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 mashallah. Uh, can you, we have about 30 seconds left, can you give the viewers some information that they would like to learn about Islamic finance? 
where can they go online? Do you have a website with your organization down there? In, uh, we have organization, uh, Al Sunan Center for Islamic Finance. You can just Google or auscif.com. You can find more information. We have YouTube clips. Uh, you can subscribe to podcast, and there are some books available for download. Inshallah, Barak Rafiq, thank you for your time. I look forward to seeing your program. Inshallah, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum. Like to you guys at home, thank you for watching. Uh, the pulse and you guys really we're going to be airing this program soon inshallah i'll let you know when it does broadcast the brother has just wrapped up a fifth or sixth episode you don't want to miss it it's educational and interesting and fun i know you probably think finance was uh, is a dry topic but believe me it's exciting the way he uh, speaks about it so you don't want to miss that only on huda tv uh, having said that uh, uh, remember to watch our youtube uh, subscribe to our new youtube channel huda satellite tv huda satellite tv Please subscribe and share on your social media. Uh, having said that, I guess that's all I have for you guys. Uh, so until next time, I leave you in the care of Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Come join us and have your say. Let's talk about our way. Remember you are not alone. Huda is the light in your home. We'll talk about Huda. We'll talk about our way. Come join us and have your say, let's talk about our way. Remember you are not alone, Huda is the light in your home.